with um, panelists joining the meeting, um, but it looks like we have the full board here now and uh, members of the public have been able to join as well. Um, and I'd recommend that you could go ahead with the meeting when you're ready. Thank you, Gina. Let's go ahead and uh, commence this meeting. Holly, if you would like to um, call the roll. Director Moran. Present. Director Falls. Here. President Swan. Here. Director Ferris. Present. Director Henry. Uh-oh, did we lose her? Did we mute her? I've seen her name on the participants list. On the attendees. Oh, she's on the attendee list? Yeah. Yeah, she's there. Oh, can we oh. unmute you? She didn't use her special number, I guess, to get in. We need to unmute her. Director Henry? She's showing muted. Lois, you're muted. There she goes. Okay, Lois, can, are you here? Yeah. Okay, okay, she's here. That's it. Holly, you got that? Thank you. I heard that. Okay. Um, Rick, are there any um, additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, staff has none. Fabulous. At this time, we'll embark on the oral communications. <clears throat> Anybody in the uh, attendee list that has anything to, that they would like to comment on that is not on tonight's agenda may do so. If you do, please raise your hand and uh, you'll be recognized and you can state a comment or whatever you want to say. Do we have any hands up? Oh, okay, we have, uh, okay, there's a winner. We have a winner, Jim Mosier. <laughs> Feel free to comment away, Mr. Mosier. Thank you, Jervin Swan. Um, yes, I just wanted to comment at the last board meeting, uh, Director Fultz stated in his opposition to approving the budget that the rate increase went entirely to operations. And I was confused by that because I remember when we, uh, when the rate increases were put in place that, as I understood it, the rate increases were needed in order to get the loans to do the infrastructure repairs. So I went back and looked at the budget and indeed, um, the, it looks to me at least, unless I'm understanding it, that the rate increase is about the same as what it's costing us to pay back the loan and the interest in principal. It's a little off to the board's credit. I believe uh, there was some renegotiations of the loan so that we got uh, better uh, terms. So there was a little left over. Um, and then there were some other increases in uh, the revenue from uh, grants, uh, an operating grant and a capital grant uh, and interest and property taxes that amounted to almost 400000 So I don't think it's a fair characterization to say that the rate increase is all going to operations uh, since they're absolutely critical to the infrastructure repair and that's their purpose. I guess we were fortunate uh, in this fiscal year to have these other revenue sources and I know this is a high priority for the board which I fully support, which is that we need to find some additional revenue streams, uh, recognizing that our costs are almost certainly going to be going up as the state report on, uh, on uh, the LIRA programs has stated pretty clearly um, that we need more revenue sources. But I, I just wanted to, maybe there's a clarification here, but the, I, the statement that the rate increases are all going to operations seems to me to, to, to not be a, a, 
a fair statement of what those uh, rate increases were imposed for and what they're being used for. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Okay. Uh, regarding that comment, does anybody on staff want to address it uh, with the I, uh, an opinion or a comment to address Mr. Mosier's uh, comment, or I we can put it on a future. I think uh, Steve, we, we might item. want to put it on a future agenda item if you want to redress it. The point of the oral communications isn't to engage too much in back and forth. Right. Well, we'll just accept it as his comment, and we'll address it in the future if necessary. Well, okay. I, I definitely will. Would like to do that for sure. Yeah, and I think okay. I think we might be able to do that within the context of looking at uh, sort of uh, all of the uh, liabilities and things that we need to spend money on and all that that hopefully will be coming to us soon. We can have that conversation within the context of that larger um, area. Okay, thank you, Bob. Okay, uh, moving along. There is no unfinished business apparently, so we'll move on to new business. Uh, Rick, you want to uh, introduce yes, our uh, new business uh, item? Well, this was uh, the introduction of the integrated pest management policy, and we have the district's environmental planner uh, uh, here to uh, present this to the board. Harley? Just to point, go ahead, I'll let Holly go. But I, I, I think there is an unfinished business. There is unfinished business, Santa Cruz County use of glyphosate. Rick? Okay, I don't have that. Item 4A. I'm not sure that. Yeah, item 4A on your agenda. Okay. Part well, of the revised agenda. There is no item 4A on my agenda, so I don't have the oh, right. Oh, you have the old agenda. Sorry. I have the old agenda. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I don't have item four. I don't have any of that in my agenda, unfortunately. Okay. Let me, let can me. Someone, can someone else bring it up and help? Well, I'm going to bring it up right now. I'm going to go uh, and, and pull it up. Okay. We're off to a great start tonight. Well, the last couple of meetings have been very good. So, you know. Oh, yeah. That, this is kind of. Real quick, I'm pulling it up now. Hopefully the, uh, the agendas. Yeah, it's the revised agenda. Okay. Okay, item uh, 4A is uh, subject to Santa Cruz County use of uh, glyphosate on, on district property. Um, I'll try to, uh, and I'll ask Director Moran to uh, to also um, jump in as he feels necessary. Um, uh, Director Moran requested this item being on uh, the agenda as a result of uh, reviewing uh, county documentation that they're possibly talking about an exemption to the use of uh, glyphosate at the Felton Library uh, going to the Board of Supervisors. There was uh, a misunderstanding. Um, the library and the parks department are not asking for this exemption. Um, it was difficult to read. Clarification needed to be uh, given uh, so uh, we could understand this item better. So we contacted both the parks department and uh, Supervisor McPherson, and I also believe Director Moran and Henry contacted Supervisor McPherson, and there is no e exemption moving forward for the use of uh, glyphosate at the Felton Library. The exemption is for using rodicides um, for rodent control um, behind uh, the library, which is still concerns to the district. Um, so we're still wanting to move forward, not with this uh, letter or an article in the press banner, but Director Moran has, uh, has worked out a, a kind of a solution to this so we don't have these confusions in, in the future. And with that, Rick, do you want to chime sure. in? Sure, sure. Um, Thank, Thank you, Rick. 
Um, last year, the Santa Cruz County Parks Department applied for an exemption to use glyphosate, a probable carcinogen, at the Felton Library Nature Discovery Park along Bull Creek, part of which is an easement that the water district gave to the library. Uh, through, a num through a number of people's concern, that exemption was pulled from the Board of Supervisors agenda last year. No glyphosate was used at the library last year. In a personal discussion with Jeff Gagne, Parks Director, at the library site last year, Mr. Gaffney said to me that while he would commit to not using glyphosate this year, meaning last year, he would not make that commitment for the future. Fast forward to last week. I reviewed an agenda from the Integrated Pest Management Department Advisory Group, the committee responsible for oversight of pesticide use in the county. In that agenda are the words, quote, exemption for vegetation management, and in parentheses, in riparian corridor behind Felton Library as needed. And uh, parentheses, will be continued in the annual Board of Supervisors letter, which goes to the supervisors uh, this next agenda meeting in the 16th. I notified our district manager, Rick Rogers, and called Supervisor McPherson's office to voice my opposition to giving an exemption to use glyphosate. Yesterday, an aide to McPherson's returned my call and said that he had contacted the parks director and the head of the Felton Library. The aide assured me that neither parks nor the library had any intention to use glyphosate at the Nature Discovery Park. To avoid any further such problems like this, I recommend that the board direct District Manager Rick Rogers to have a meeting with representatives from the County Parks, Felton Library, and the San Lorenzo Valley Water District to seek an agreement about a long-term solution to the problem of using glyphosate on the Felton Library Nature Discovery Park. Thank you, that's my spiel, thank you. And, and just to, to follow up on Rick says, you know, staff believes that's a good idea and staff would facilitate a meeting uh, with the parks and county and library and uh, Director Moran, um, if he would be so kind as the chair of the environmental committee to attend with staff um, and have said discussion. Um, I think that would be a great idea. And as you know, we, we share the adjoining property. Um, so we have a lot of common concerns um, in that area. Bob, you have a uh, comment or question? Um, just, just a comment. I mean, I, I really, you know, Rick, I really appreciate what you uh, did there and, you know, flagging this for our attention. Thank you for staying on top of that. You know, we, we talked about this last year a little bit in terms of getting something in writing, uh, changes to the easement agreement, uh, some second agreement to cover the rest of the property there. Is that what you have in mind, uh, getting, getting to where we're we have all this sort of cleared up so that we don't have to uh, revisit it year after year after year. Exactly. Okay, right. Yeah, no, so, so far it's been uh, verbal uh, communication and okay. it, it should be, it's something that we can all agree on in writing. Right, well, and, and, and Lois, thanks for uh, contacting uh, um, Bruce McPherson as well. I mean, we, we really need to get this taken care of. I, I fully support this. Any other uh, comments or questions by any of the directors? You know what? I'm not showing as a director. I think I'm showing as an outsider. I put my paw up. Can you, you hear? Yeah, you, oh, yeah. you are in the you what? Yeah. We hear you, Lois, loud and clear. Okay. I don't know why I'm in as public, but hey, um, at least I'm in. 
Well, yeah, I, I think that we need to tr reach some kind of an agreement. I even reached out to John Leopold because I've known him for quite a while um, and said something about, you know, the, the county has this policy that they don't use glyphosate, but they also are willing to do exemptions whenever they feel like it. So why even have a policy? Um, so anyway, I, I need to get back to him and tell him that it was not going to happen. But I, I appreciate um, you, Rick Moran, working on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the so the staff will take that direction then that's been discussed. Do we have any? Uh, do we need a? You know, we have some comments from the attendees here. Who do we have? Beth Thomas, you're recognized for three minutes or five minutes, whatever you want to say. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, unclear. I just want to say thank you to Rick also because I, you know, after the board has gone through so much trouble to really define what their priorities are, it's crazy that the county could come along behind and undo it. Uh, and I do think it needs to be a permanent for it because we're not going to be able to depend upon somebody else, somebody having to do that on a yearly basis. Um, my son happens to work for the county. And they do have, you know, they do have this policy, but they are willing pretty regularly, uh, at least from the perspective of their workers, to make exemptions. And so maybe we really, I think, I think in that meeting, it needs to really be made clear, as Lois did with John Leopold, that, you know, the Valley is not interested in having glyphosate uh, on frequent exemptions on their property. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Jim Mosier. You're still muted, Jim. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes I just, uh, I'm a member of Felton Library Friends. This has been an issue of uh, concern and interest of us. I appreciate Rick following up on this. I'm a little frustrated with the Parks Department. They have had no communication with us about it. On Saturday, there's going to be a volunteer day on the Felton Library uh, Park a site in which we're going to be digging up uh, blackberries, among other things, as part of our effort to find a way to remove some of these invasive species without pesticides. Um, and so I just want to say that uh, we're full support of the district's priority here. Um, I think there's also an opportunity for the board and when you meet with the parks and the library, there are other, uh, you know, there, there are other ways uh, where other things to do in a positive way to collaborate. Maybe, uh, I thought <clears throat> this might come up when we get to the um, to the presentation on public relations, because I think there's a real opportunity for the district to be reaching out to the community and ratepayers through this uh, partnership. Um, and I make a personal commitment to uh, reach out to the Parks Department and, and just um, tell them that this is something that the community is not interested in. I think we're in full agreement here. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Is there public comment? I don't see any. Any other director comments? No? Okay. Uh, Rick, oh, oops. Rick, did you have a question, comment? Which Rick? Your blue hand, Rick Moran. Your yeah. No, no, I do not. Up, disappeared. Okay, no. uh, Bob, you got a final parting word on this? Yeah, you know, I, I would, it would be great if the county would reconsider what I call their Potemkin policy on glyphosate. I mean, it's really quite a facade. They they say we're not going to use it, but really behind the scenes, they do it all the time. But I think we should recognize that may not happen. And so, you know, as terms of countywide, 
but if we can at least make sure we're protecting SLV, I think that would be a, a big win for the community. Okay, great. Um, so Rick Rogers, you're all set with, I mean, staff has direction on this item. We don't need a motion. Right. Or I'll work with Director Moran and, and we'll move forward with facilitating a meeting. Um, and because uh, we do have some other, we need to talk about rodent control as well um, and some other things that we could uh, work on joint efforts with. Super, okay. Uh, th there isn't any other unfinished business, is there? I don't believe so. Okay, moving on to new business and we left off at the integrated pest management policy. And you were gonna let Carly, I think, take that? That's correct. Uh, item 5A is the integrated pest management uh, policy and we have the environmental planner that will present this item. Carly? Right, well, that's a perfect segue into this item. You can um, see it. <laughs> Um, so right now, the the district with the glyphosate ban has been working on an integrated pest management plan for the last year or so. Um, the integrated pest management policy or plan should alleviate pest problems with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. The policy should include a list of improved pesticides with the idea that the a committee of either the environmental committee or an integrated pest management committee the coordinator and the board of directors approval, um, proper education and training for staff and the public, established guidelines for all pest problems and exemptions that can be identified as well as the integrated pest management coordinator alerted of any usage in um, our operations. Right now, the draft does follow the county's policy pretty closely along with some other agencies involved. Um, on May 28th, the Environmental Committee in a special meeting reviewed the draft and voted to bring the full policy to the full Board of Directors for approval. And it is recommended for the Board of Directors to review the draft and determine if the policy should be implemented. And I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Do we have any questions uh, from the directors? Well, I'll, I'll go. I don't have a question, but uh, if I could, uh, you know, I have some things I'd like to say to add to Carly's uh, presentation, if I could. Yeah. Feel okay, free. thank you. Uh, in 2016, I was a member of the Environmental Committee. Um, the board uh, had directed the Environmental Committee that year to write an integrated pest management plan. This is 2016. That previous board did not accomplish that task. When I was appointed to the board, I stated as one of my goals was to finish the job of creating an integrated pest management plan. Now, with the leadership of Director District Manager Rick Rogers and the work of environmental planner Carly Blanchard, the district has a proposed IPM plan. The plan has developed, was developed, as Carly said, I just want to reiterate this, um, developed by reviewing Santa Cruz County's Integrated Pest Management Plan, the City of Santa Cruz's plan, and other water districts' plans, and adding our own specific concerns. This plan has the goal to eliminate the use of pesticides, which include herbicides, insecticides, rodenticides, and that are dangerous to the watershed, its residents, staff, and wildlife. This plan deals with training of staff, public notice of pesticide use, board review, and public input, and evaluation and record keeping. The plan's goal is to be transparent. It also allows for revisions when justified. It is the foundation that can be built upon. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Any other uh, comments? Steve, I do not have the ability to raise my hand right now, so I'm just going to verbally interject if I may. Please do. I have uh, reviewed this actually twice. I did it last week as part of the Environmental Committee and made one comment to, to Rick and Carly about Section 4D. 
I've gone back over it and I now have three more questions. And for the sake of uh, brevity in the, the board meeting, I'm gonna suggest that I have an offline conference call with Carly and, and Rick to go over these minor points, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, Bob, you have a comment? Yeah, uh, in general, again, I wanna thank Rick for, for his leadership uh, on this particular issue. I mean, this is something that um, uh, I, you know, after meeting Rick at that infamous meeting um, and really coming to understand the depth of his commitment in this area, um, you know, this is something that I wanted to see done going back to our, um, you know, our role uh, in November of 2018. Um, and so I'm really, really happy that we are uh, at the point here where we can approve something that is going to start uh, addressing things at a policy level um, going forward. And I think this is, you know, just another reason why, um, you know, Rick uh, needed to be appointed to the board to make sure this kind of thing happened. I, I think there are some things in the policy document. There's probably some, some cleanup items, some typos, that sort of thing that I'm sure we can address um, as part of a second uh, go round in this after we approve it and get this policy into place. Uh, as I was reviewing it, I did notice there was a, a few areas that, that may need be in need of some assistance. That may be what Lou was talking about as well in the same section. Um, so I think let's go ahead and, and vote on it. And then uh, Rick, if it's something you wanted to, to continue working on in the environmental committee on some of those items, that would be great. Thank you, Bob. Any other uh, comments from any other directors? I think right. it's good. Thank you, Lois. And we don't, do we actually vote on this or not? It doesn't show under the uh, recommendation to vote on this. Right. It's a possible so action. It, it should say possible action for us <laughs> to vote on it. Uh, Gina, do you want to weigh in? I do believe we should adopt this as a policy. It says provide it does direction. Say, That's a... It does say possible action in the, on the agenda. Yeah, so that's, all, that's great. That's what we needed. Yeah, I think the wording is sufficient to allow it to move forward, and it could be adopted by a motion of the board tonight. Oh, okay, great. Let's, let's give the attendees an opportunity to share some of their uh, thoughts on this. And look, we've got uh, Mr. Mosier, you are recognized. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I just wanna congratulate the board for this. I really appreciate particularly the first sentence that the goal is to not use pesticides uh, at all. Um, and um, I think it's great that uh, Rick's been working on this and the committee has been working on it. I just have one question, um, which is that uh, one of the pests that has been a, a, a focal point for us over the last few years has been a broom on the sand hills. <clears throat> and I'm just wondering if the committee has addressed that uh, in the context of this policy, how are we gonna approach uh, getting that invasive species out of that sensitive habitat? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, we have another question from Beth Thomas. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say uh, something similar uh, along the lines of Jim, Jim's comment. I attended the last uh, meeting, environmental committee meeting, and I was really, I felt very hopeful about the new policy. And I think that the community will appreciate it as well. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no other comments back. Does uh, Rick, do you want to address this particular question from the audience? Is it sure. Uh, and Carly, you can back me up here a little bit. Um, so in the, I believe uh, Carly has scheduled um, biologist Jody McGraw to be at the July Environmental Committee meeting? Yes? That's correct. Yes. 
And uh, Jody McGraw is working on a habitat conservation plan. And part of that habitat conservation plan is to find ways to deal with invasive species um, on the Olympia watershed. So with Jody's help and Carly's, uh, that issue of a uh, broom will be discussed. Okay, terrific. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, we have a late question here from the attendees. You, you need to be bringing your questions up when it's time for the attendees to raise their questions for the audience. Uh, EJ Armstrong, if you got something imperative to share right now or a question that's pertinent, go ahead. I'll give you an opportunity this time. It's not imperative. I was just uh, making a point regarding uh, insurance liability. Does this influence the cost of insurance? I don't know. I don't know that. Does anybody know if this has any impact on insurance or liability? Not to my knowledge. I don't. Okay. You know, I, think, I think, I think, Steve, the probably the bigger issue might be is if we were to continue using some of these known carcinogens or probable carcinogens, who knows what happens down the line 15 years or so with respect to um, a plaintiff's cause. Um, so whether or not that results in anything short term or not is, um, is really unknown from my point of view. But I think in addition to being the right thing to do, I think we're also protecting, doing what we should be doing as a board, which is looking long term and protecting the district from those kinds of potential risks. Hey, Bob. Uh, okay, so the uh, can we get a motion on this yeah. item? Chairman Swan, yeah. if, I, if I could make a procedural recommendation here um, for the motion, I see that we the version attached to the board packet has draft stamped on it. I'd recommend a motion um, to adopt the attached, uh, the draft integrated pest management policy uh, that's in the board packet as the final policy and remove the draft watermark. Okay. Uh, does somebody want to make that motion? I, think um, can make I will make that motion using Gina's language, if I could. Thank I'll you. Second. I'll second it. And second it. Okay. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Holly, are you still with us? I can't. My computer wasn't. My mouse wasn't working. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, Director Moran. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. President Swan. Yes. Director Ferris. Aye. Director Henry. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Holly. Um. President Swan, could I just take one moment? Sure. Um, I would like to thank um, former director Eric Hammer for um, finally seeing this through. It was his motion to the board in 2016 to start this. And um, he deserves a nod of appreciation for this to, to former director Eric Hammer. Thank you. So recognized. Rick, back to you. Okay, item uh, 5B uh, is the California Special Districts Association uh, 2020 Board of Directors election. It's recommended that the Board of Directors review and consider the nominees for the CSDA Board of Directors seat uh, C in the Coastal Network, uh, term 2021 to 2023. Each of the CSDA six networks have three seats on the CSDA board. Each of the candidates is either a board member or a management level employee of a member district located in the network. As a regular member in good standings, we are entitled to one vote. The district received notice of an upcoming election for an open seat on the CSDA Board of Directors, seat C, in the Coastal Network. Candidate information is provided for two nominees in your packet. Uh, the Santa Rosa Valley Board of Directors may choose to vote for one candidate. 
and the deadline for this is 5 p.m. on Friday, July 10th, 2020. I'll turn it back over to the to the chair. Thank you, Rick. Okay, uh, directors, anybody have a comment on any of the two prospective nominees for the seat? Does anybody know either one? Okay. Well, they're, you've got their... Um, no, no, I know we have their stuff, but I mean, does anybody personally? I do not. I do not. I okay. Uh, okay. Well, so none of us know. We've had their resumes to whatever extent they've been completed in here. Does anybody have any comments on either of the two that they'd like to share? Or do we see want to go to the public and see, get their input if they know anybody? I put my paw up. Oh, I'm sorry, Lois. You're still showing up under the attendees. Uh, go right ahead. Put your uh, blue hand down and give us your piece. Okay, you want me to put my blue hand down? No, I don't care, Lewis. <laughs> you lose your foot <laughs> while I care. I, I, I just kind of um, like Vincent Ferrante. Uh, it just seems like he has a lot of background and knowledge. And that's all. Okay, thanks, Lewis. In, in, in reading the material, I also like Vincent. But, uh, you know, it's not a hard line one way or the other. Yeah. Any of the attendees or the public have any comment on these two individuals that they'd like to share? No? Okay. Uh, so this is uh, July 5th is the deadline for this. Do, does anybody uh, have a, anybody got a coin they want to flip? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think when looking at this on balance, you know, from my point of view, it, I think Vincent uh, would be, would be fine. He's also more local. <laughs> so I, I would, um, if it's okay, I'd go ahead and um, nominate or, not sure exactly how to do it, Gina, but you know that we would vote for. I move that we would vote for Vincent Ferrante as the 2021-2023 CSDA board uh, nominee. Great, and I'll second that. And um, Director Swan or President Swan, I do see that there's a hand up uh, by a member of the public who I believe wanted to comment on this item. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that before. Uh, Tina, you are recognized for comments. Thank you. Is there a reason that there's a month, this is a month away. Is there a reason why the board couldn't interview these people or is there a reason why you wouldn't want to get more information before making the decision? Well, no, historically this hasn't, we haven't done that. We've had the the material has been presented to the board of the candidates, and then we've based our votes based on the material that's been provided. I, I, I mean, I have enough information to be able to vote. Yeah. Their backgrounds, and he's an incumbent as well, this yeah. Vincent fellow. I mean, so. the other gentleman, it's not that the other gentleman isn't qualified. He did serve on the CSDA board in a different region at one point. Mm -hmm. But um, I just based on the material we have there and a little quick internet research I did, I think Mr. Bronte would be fine. I have the information I need. Okay, great. So we've had a, uh, a motion and a second. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Director Moran? Uh, yes, I would vote for Vincent Ferrante. Director Falls? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris. Aye. Director Henry. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much, Holly. Back to you, Rick. Okay, item 5C of your agenda is the CAL FIRE California Forest Improvement Program represent, uh, representative authorization. Uh, and the environmental planner will give this staff presentation, Carly. 
Sorry about that. I think I have a different agenda. Let me go ahead and scroll through that. Um, but pretty much uh, Panorama, who we're working with for our fire management plan, is hoping to apply for CFIP, which is a Cal Fire grant. Um, and they need to select a representative from the district staff to move that grant forward um, in the application process. So we've selected Rick Rogers as that staff member, um, and we wanted to have the board go ahead and move forward that resolution. Thank you, Carly. Uh, any questions or comments by the board? Well, Rick Rogers is a local person. Uh, I do know Rick Rogers. Do we know Rick Rogers? <laughs> I would I would support him being the representative for the district. Mighty generous of you, Rick. <laughs> I, I think I think the purpose of this is that just the district manager is appointed as the signatory and the representative of the district. <laughs> I, I, okay. Well, and I have this is district council. I have one clarification to the resolution. Um, unless the desire is for the district manager to bring all the applications and agreements back to the board before signing. Um, then I would recommend making one edit to the resolution in the resolve paragraph where it says, now therefore be it resolved by the board of directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, it should be now therefore be it resolved by the board of the San, directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, the board, the, that the board hereby authorizes and directs the district manager, Rick Rogers, to serve as the district's point of contact and signatory for CFIP applications, agreements, and any related documents. I would like to make that resolution. Wait a minute, Lois. Number hey, 24. Hang on, hang on, Lois. Let's, let's, uh, well, let's I can go ahead and say I, I want to suggest we agree to this resolution number 24 1920 and everybody can still talk thank you okay uh bob you had a uh, you have your hand up yeah i just wanted to make sure i i got uh clarity on what what that meant does that mean gina that the any of those grant documents whatever um obligations or what have you the district is taking on would not come back to the board for review it would mean they wouldn't have to. I, I mean, now you could you could give him this authority, and um, yet ask that the board review agreements before um, they're signed, as opposed to you know there may be a lot of sort of ministerial paperwork that goes with this that you may not want to see. Yeah, I mean, mostly um, uh, what I'd be personally interested in is the meat of the agreement, right? Sort of what the what the um, responsibilities and um, uh, benefits and all the rest of it of each party. I, I don't really care too much about the ministerial stuff, but the business part of it, I, I would like to see again. But that's just maybe me. Okay. And I have, I have one comment, Gina, do we need to have my name in there? Or can it just be the district manager? Because we get these agreements or resolutions that have by name and then when the district manager changes, we find ourselves behind the curve. Does it need to have a, an actual name or can it be the title? We have been using the title. Typically, I would think the title would be sufficient, but you know, I haven't reviewed the, the paperwork from this program. Um, so um, perhaps the environmental planner could speak to uh, whether they require, you know, the actual name of the of the individual for this. From my understanding, it does need to be an individual's name, um, but we can also come back to the board if we need to change that in the future. Could I? I'm going to put my hand up. Okay, I'll pretend I see it. <laughs> Okay, I, I would like a name in there because um, I, if we got a new district manager, maybe I wouldn't be thrilled with the new one or whatever, like the last one. Uh, I would like a name. Okay. 
Rick, is, uh, are the documents something that we can at least put as an attachment to an agenda item for information purposes? Bob, are you, who are you, are you addressing me or Carly? I'm sorry. Uh, I was addressing you. Oh, yeah, you broke off. I'm... Oh, sorry. Maybe my broadband is starting to, get, maybe it's the uh, eight o'clock witching hour coming up. Um, I, no, I was just asking, is this, uh, could we bring the documents back um, at least as information items um, before we uh, execute them? Carly? Um... We can. Um, we can also bring this to the Environmental Committee if that's something of interest. I mean, this is right now, it's the very initial steps of applying for this grant. Um, so as we move forward, we can bring that to either the committee or the board, but we also do have all the background information if the board is interested in that. Okay. Like I say, I'm mainly just interested in the in the final part, but I do think, Carly, your suggestion about keeping the environmental committee fully involved and informed would be a really great idea. Right. And I, I, have, I have no problem with that. And if there was a document that, you know, I'm I'm pretty conservative on making sure the board is kept kept informed or if there was something I was uh, I was committing the district to I would not do that without board approval um, that's just not the way I work so I would I would have no problem bringing anything back to the board that they so desire to, to review fabulous thank you okay. any other uh, comments <coughs> well I, I don't know if Lois had got a second on her Motion. Did you make a motion, Lois, or did we? Yes, I did. I didn't get a second. Okay, well, I will second it, but I think we need to talk to the um, as well. Okay, let's uh, thank you. So we have a motion and a second, and now we'll open. If there's an, any attendees that have any comments or questions, feel free to raise your blue hands. Okay, I see none. Come back. So we have a motion and we have a second. Holly, would you like to uh, take a vote? Director Moran? Yes. Director Fulz? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. President, excuse me, Director Henry? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Holly. Back to you, Rick. Hey, uh, item 5D is a memo from uh, General Counsel about a, uh, a policy for visual and written materials. And I'll ask District Counsel to present uh, this item. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, and I'll summarize what's in the agenda packet. Um, Government Code Section 54957.5, which is cited in the memo, um, governs when materials that are made available to the board of directors, a, a majority of the board of directors, for purposes of a board meeting, when that material also must be made available to the public. And in particular, it requires that anything that's shown to the board at the meeting also be provided to the public uh, at the same meeting. So this creates an issue that has been raised in the context of these Zoom meetings where um, the district prior to conducting meetings virtually because of this COVID-19 environment would bring hard copies of materials that weren't available until the day of the meeting to the meeting and pass them out to board members and the public. Um, and while this wasn't done frequently, um, it, it was a way to deal with the issue of materials that were created late. Um, now that we're using the Zoom platform for remote meetings, um, that really doesn't work because there's no good way to distribute materials at the same time to the board members and um, interested members of the public. So what I've done is created a draft policy that's um, on the first page of the board memo that's intended to address this situation. And what it does is ask that anyone who has um, late written or visual materials um, that were not included in the posted agenda packet, uh, provide those to the district secretary by noon the day before the meeting. 
um, so that the district secretary can uh, arrange to have them posted to the website before the meeting, which is a way to make them available to both the public and uh, the board members at the same time. Um, so this, this is both intended to, pro to, to promote compliance with the government code, also just transparency generally, um, as well as good governance by making materials available in advance of meetings to the greatest extent, extent possible so that they can be reviewed prior to the meeting. Um, I understand there may be some desires uh, on the part of um, uh, perhaps staff and board to tweak what's been proposed here, um, which is why I presented it in the memo in memo form. And um, based on the discussion tonight, what I plan to do is to prepare an actual um, revision to the board manual to reflect whatever um, you know the board determines tonight that it wants to do, and then I'll bring that back to another meeting for formal approval. Thank you, Gina. Any questions or comments uh, among the board? Director Fultz. Yes, it helped to go off. Yeah, no, it helped to go off mute. Um, yeah, so Gina, thanks for bringing this to our attention because, you know, this is something that I think is um, really applicable not only for meetings conducted virtually, but, but really for all meetings, board and committee. Uh, would it would it be out of um, would it be compatible with what you're trying to do if we um, were to remove that first clause for meeting conducted virtually and just start any written materials to be presented at a board or committee meeting that are not posted with the agenda packet shall be provided, etc. Um, and then uh, a little further down, there's the word should. Um, and I guess my question is, is it illegal if we were to present any material not provided beforehand, or is it in a gray area and that's why you have it should, and as opposed to will not? Uh, okay, so in, in taking your questions in order, Director Fultz, um, certainly the first clause could be dropped um, to make this applicable to meetings more generally. Um, if, we, if the direction is to do that, I would most likely also put this proposed policy in a different section of the board manual. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll figure that out and bring that back to the board for another uh, review uh, to, to finalize it, if that's the direction um, that the board wants to go. Um, in terms of should rather than, um, you know, shall not be. Um, yeah, that that line, the line, the word should was was intentionally uh, a little bit loose because um, what the Brown Act says is that materials, um, and, and and I'll paraphrase a little bit here, but when materials created are, are shown by a board or a staff member to the board in conjunction with a public meeting. They need to be made available to the public at the same time they're shown to the board. So um, one way that can be done is to, like I said, is to simply bring hard copies for everyone, board and public, and do it at a meeting. Um, there are ways to do this without posting them to the website before the meeting. But I think the, the, the objective of this policy is to minimize those occurrences to situations where it's absolutely necessary for some reason and to discourage and avoid situations where um, you know, there's sort of a surprise that's unnecessary that can be avoided. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Well, you know, from my perspective, just from a maximum transparency point of view, I always like to have materials that are provided at the at the board to be uh, posted on the uh, on the website at, at some point. It, obviously, if it happens beforehand, that's better for the directors relative to being able to have a full context of what we may be voting on that that evening and for things that you know come up as as they will do at least they can get posted retrospectively with the agenda maybe a day or two or a few days later so that uh, the public that didn't attend would have the advantage of being able to see those materials as well I, I think in keeping with our 
goal of maximum transparency that, that both of those would be good uh, improvements to me. Any other uh, questions, comments for uh, Gina? I don't. <laughs> You don't, okay. Lois? Oh, I'm sorry. You're. I, I, I'm trying to understand what Bob just said. Um, it sounded like he said um, he wants the board to know about it ahead of time, but then a few days later could be posted on the website. Am I going deaf or? Goofy? Well. No, I think you, I think you, I'm, I might not have sort of explained the subtlety a little bit. As a matter of practice, um, and as a matter of, I think, transparency and, and respect for our community, materials that are going to be presented at the board meeting, um, and this is typically by staff, should be posted uh, with the agenda item. And if it can't be put into the board packet, it should be posted according to what Gina wrote here, which is you know noon before the uh, before the meeting, and I would extend that to committee meetings as well. The, I, I recognize that there may be times when that just can't happen for whatever reason. Somebody's laptop crashes, or there's a broadband issue, or what have you. And so, on those rare occasions when materials can't be provided to the community and the board beforehand then at least if they're posted later, you know, within a reasonably short period of time, um, I think that would make sense. Again, this is all from the point of view of making sure that we're maximally transparent with our community and providing all the materials that we see to the community uh, in a very timely fashion. Okay, I guess my confusion here is that The reason to have an agenda is so everyone's aware what we're going to talk about. So for somebody just to show up at the meeting, I, I, I get sometimes people read statements, um, but that's not part of the agenda. So how we can discuss and do things that were not part of the agenda to begin with, I don't get that. And also, just about committees, uh, it would be nice um, for committees if there's late items for them to be posted. But like this week, there was budget finance, there was admin, now there's this meeting, how much burden does that put on Holly? Is that uh, too much? I, I, I just really uh, have to wonder about that. I have some real concerns about that too. I, I don't know if we could make this, I think it's gonna be hit or miss. People are assuming if they send to Holly noon before, or to the district secretary noon before the meeting, and if Holly's off or ill, I mean, it, I don't know how we're gonna be sure that one, the district receives it, and two, that we get it up and get it posted in time. You know, people are gonna think if they send it in for a certain deadline that it's going to get to the board. And I'm not sure we can guarantee that. I mean, we're putting an awful lot on one person. Well, and I thought the deadline was uh, like, Okay, for this meeting, that it would have been the Thursday before the Friday that the agenda went out. Well, I mean, I, I, I think the other option here, and I think what Gina's is trying to do is provide some flexibility for everybody to keep working on presentations, mainly at a staff level, which I certainly appreciate. But the other option is to say that all materials are going to be presented at the board meeting. Um, are put into the agenda packet without exception. Um, and again, this goes to transparency with the community. You know, we, we, we need to make sure that whatever is being, and it's like the, um, the marketing communications presentation we're going to see a little bit later. I found it very helpful to have that information in hand prior to the meeting tonight. Um, and so that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, I'd rather not go down the path of it all has to be in 
the board packet and nothing can be brought in later because I think that's way too inflexible. And I think Gina could probably come up with some words that will make sure that we deal with those situations where stuff happens and, and you can't get it done for uh, whatever reason. It's not meant to be um, that hard, but I do believe that we need to make sure that all those materials without exception get posted to the uh, website agendas, either as addendums or updates to the board packet or all that at some point in order to make sure that we are as transparent as possible with our community. I don't have a problem with that. It's just that I, I see issues with some items getting to the board in, a, in the time frame, and other items sitting in Holly's inbox so she's not here and then these people are going to expect the board to review or see that information and they're not going to have it or they're going to get it right as they go into the meeting. I mean, the time frame is awful tight and you're planning all this on one individual. I, I just think it's, you know, I, I understand what you're trying to do, Bob, and I'm, I'm all supportive of getting information to the board and to the public, but I, I'm not sure that we can consistent, consistently, you know, function like that because, you know, I've had, since we've gone to virtual meetings, I've had a couple, you know, customers submit things and want to get to the board the day before the meeting or, and that, and and this is kind of where this came from and working with Gina and, you know, what to do with these documents. I understand, Rick. I just, I know that there are times when we have gotten documentation at the board meeting and, and uh, if you weren't physically present, you didn't get a copy. And I, I don't think that's right either. Um, so, right. The, the, you know, we're, we're obviously wanting to try to find a, a balance here that will work, but I, I think where we are today just isn't, where we need to be from a transparency point of view. Well, I'll, I'll let Holly speak up too. She may have, you know, I'm, I don't want to speak for her. I'm just thinking of, of the issues that we're going to have if the district secretary wants to add to that. Um, yeah, Lois, your hand's up. Are you asking, trying to ask a question or did you well, just I, go over? I guess I, my hand's up. Yeah, it is. Oh, I guess I never put it down. Sorry. There we go. Okay. You yeah. normally okay. don't even see it anyway. Well, I'm <laughs> focusing on you, Lois. So <laughs> okay. hang in there. You know, I, I, in listening to all this, I, I don't know that if what's the uh, what's the process today. So so today, if we have something that's the exception, right? I mean, it, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. You know, we have a meeting essentially every couple of weeks, two week two two meetings a month normally normally. And getting all your stuff in the agenda items in and locked down by the Thursday before the a week before the meeting so that it can be published on Fridays. Uh, if there's something critical that comes up, the process currently is we print a bunch of this is when we're having physical meetings, right? We print up the uh, is it we print up a, a change to the agenda and lay them on a the table on that Thursday of the meeting. And uh, and and update the online agenda, or what exactly do we do? Somebody refresh my feeble, adult memory. <laughs> Holly, you well, want to tell the process? I yeah, think we're Holly, talking about question. Question. We're talking about you, staff. I'd rather hear from you. Is Holly on mute? Did she just get tired? Yeah. Holly, you're on mute. Uh, so, yes, in the past, if there was something that was handed to me um, before the meeting, it would have to be before the meeting. Sometimes people brought things to the meeting, in which case uh, it was, uh, you know, either shared if there was more than one or uh, it was saved and posted later. But uh, I'm perfectly fine with adding things right up until the last minute. The, the way we're doing it now where we're, it's, we don't have to do a lot of paper works for me. I, I don't mind as long as I get it. But if, if I don't get it in time, then there's nothing I can do about it. So that, that's my concern. So if, if it's sent to me at, at 3.30 and I don't see it, then I can't get it posted. But other than that, I can get it up there pretty quick. Thanks to Scott. Okay. I, I think there's two issues here. One is items from district staff which we have good control over and good contact with the district secretary and we can make sure they get 
posted when they're supposed to get posted and go out with the agenda. Now that's an internal issue. But then there's the, from the customer that sends you an email and says, I want this to go to the board. Hey, Rick, just to, just to make sure we're clear here, um, and maybe I wasn't, most of my comments around that had to do specifically with information and presentations from district staff or from our uh, consultants or um, you know other professional staff that we hire. It was not meant to try to encompass everything. If we can, of course, that's great. But I recognize that things that come in randomly from uh, the community may need to be dealt with at a future meeting or attached as information to the minutes or something like that. I, I, I understand that. Well, okay. Yeah, well, if, if it's if those are the presentations and, and staff memos, we can we can work on that internally. I mean, that's an issue that staff can work on and we can make sure that you have ample time. I was thinking more of, because I have received emails from customers who wanted it to get to the board for public comment right before the meeting. And, you know, we- Did they want you to read it or something or just provide- No, they wanted to pass it on to the board. Oh, well, they can email us. I mean, we Yeah, our- they wanted it at the meeting. So, I mean, I was more worried well, I don't, about I don't- that type of- Yeah, I got you, okay. As a general rule, though, I don't think the board should have their agenda upset at the last minute, you know? I, I mean, if anything is worthy of coming before the board, the board should have days of opportunity to read the agenda items. I agree, I agree. that, you know, if it's a staff presentation or something else, we could change the wording so that it specifically reflects that type of item. Uh, so that, yeah, any any material that's in process of being produced for presentation, but it's already a known agenda item, fine, let that... I agree. Let that get posted the day before or the day of the meeting or the day before whatever the, the verbiage that Gina wants to use. That's fine. But as far as any other ad hoc uh, item, I don't really want to see that come before the board, at, you know, an hour or two before the board meeting or a, even a half a day. We can agendize it. If necessary, we can agendize it for future. I Correct. got my paw up. <laughs> Oh, okay. I see your I see your blue hand, Lois. Yeah, so I, I had I my paw up before Bob. I, I just Bob had his hand up. I don't see. Go ahead, Lois. I just, just wanted to, I wanted to say uh, to you, Steve, that your statement made a whole lot of sense. I don't like getting things at a last at the last minute. And in fact, have been fussing with Santa Margarita and wanting information way ahead of time. I don't want things sprung on me at the last minute because if it's complicated, I like to think about things, mull them over, and I don't like this last minute stuff. Frankly, well, that, maybe, that's it. Maybe a suggestion: we move this to the admin committee, where can we can discuss and spend time and work with council. Fine with me. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, think. Bob, your thoughts on that? Sorry, let me unmute. Um, yeah, that, that's that's fine. Um, I I mean, I, I appreciate what Gina put together there, and I I want to make sure that her efforts are recognize that I think it's an admirable effort to try to make sure we maintain that transparency with the community. Um, I think from this discussion, there certainly seems to be, I think, a consensus around um, uh, staff versus other things. And I think in the admin committee, we should be able to work through that pretty straightforward. Right. You know, because I have questions whether, you know, because we do some uh, PowerPoint presentations the night of the meeting, and we don't put them in the packet. And if that's unacceptable, you know, we should we should get that in our policy and and make sure you know staff understands that that the board, you know, doesn't want to be surprised at the board meeting and wants the presentation with the packet. Um, we should we should discuss this in more in more depth. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that'd be a good thing if everybody else is okay with that. Sounds yeah, like Lois and I are. Gina, good direction. I'm good with that. Yeah, that, that sounds good to me. I'm happy to take whatever direction comes out of the committee and the board on this uh, on this item. I do want to suggest that committees 
could be treated just like the board or they could be treated differently for purposes of managing the administrative burden that goes with this. Sure, of course. And we can cover that in the committee meeting. Thanks, Gina. Okay, there's your direction, staff and, uh, oh, and President Swan, I, I don't oh, think we sorry. got any public comment on this, uh, this item. The public care, let's get some feedback from them. We have eight people, diehards left on the phone I'm sorry, seven, because I'm not counting Lois. Does anyone <laughs> have any of the any of the public have care to weigh in on this this uh, critical matter? Seeing none. Okay. Back to you, Rick. Okay, we have uh, item five e. Uh, in 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 March uh, 2020, the district entered into a contract with Chatterbox PR to establish outreach and communications plan. On April 9, 2020, Chatterbox launched a survey to get an in-depth understanding of the needs of the district customers and preferred avenues of communications. The survey ended uh, April 27th with nearly um, 1,000 response. Chatterbox, Chatterbox has evaluated the survey results and compiled the data. Uh, using the survey results and the information provided by staff, Chatterbox will develop an outreach and communications plan. Staff and Chatterbox will begin impl implementing strategies and will plan to present the full communications and outreach plan. Uh, Marcy uh, Bracco is, is here from Chatterbox. She's the uh, owner and managing uh, partner and will present uh, the survey results and answer questions. Marcy, are you still I'm with us? Here. <laughs> How are you? Thank I'll you turn all. it over to you. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Um, okay, for me to start giving an overview, is that good? Sure. Okay, perfect. So <coughs> in, in your packets, um, you should have the PowerPoint that we're going to talk about now, as well as some backup data, which is the raw data in an Excel format from the presentation, and the questions that were individually asked in the survey. So I want to spend time on a couple slides tonight, and then I'm happy to answer any more in-depth questions. But I wanted to talk about our goal was really to go out into the community, try and find what our public perception was, what San Lorenzo Valley Water District's strengths and weaknesses are, who our key stakeholders are in the community, and the demographics of who we're working with, as well as to really get our consumer confidence and talk about how do people really want to hear from us? We have many tools. We have the website, we have social media, um, we have media relations, we have community relations, we have inserts that go out as mailers, we have direct mail campaigns, but what is it that our public really would like to know about us? So in addition to doing a survey and asking the key questions that we're gonna go over next, um, we also did some informational focus groups with key media outlets and people who did not want to take the survey did calls with us. So I wanted to, if there's no questions or see if there's any questions on the overall goal of the campaign and then move to what we actually did. Does anyone have any questions on this particular slide? I don't think so. Okay, perfect. Wait, wait, um, somebody stands up. Oh, we're not going to the public yet. Please go ahead, Marcy. Yeah. Okay, um, Ian, are you are you there to help me move to my next slide? We're going to go to the um, last three slides we talked about. So the slides that we're skipping over in the presentation are the actual questions that you have, and I want to go to what the results were and talk about the key summarization of the questions. Um, so if we can all look at that slide that we have up. So the findings were that 30, we had almost a thousand people respond to the survey in addition to speaking with key media out in the community. Um, we have 32% of the people that were satisfied overall with the survey, which is good, and 47% that were satisfied. So excuse me, 32% very satisfied. 47% um, that were satisfied. So out of a thousand people, I think that's a really um, good statistical result. 
the stakeholders' concerns that they had or wishes that they had were that they would receive information in a more timely manner and that they would also like to receive information on a regular basis it's in a way that's easily accessible for them. Whoops. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Sorry, somehow I muted myself. I'm Italian and I talk with my hands, so I must have <laughs> thrown them up in the air to mute myself. Um, I was saying stakeholders um, answer the survey on how they would like to receive information. And a large portion of the st stakeholders wanted to start seeing social media more in use. 87% of the customers wanted more information through e-newsletters or e-blasts. So it's something that the San Lorenzo Valley Water District is already doing, but we will work on expanding that program. And 27% of, of the customers wanted both to keep getting information in print and to also have what is in print um, sent to them in an e-newsletter. And then in regards to the news media, um, they would like us to really set up a communications forum with them where we're working on sending monthly press releases, reaching out to them, writing some guest columns, and bringing them out and taking them on tours, becoming more of a partner with them. And then the other thing that came out of that was on making sure that the key members in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, and that can be from the board to the staff, are seen in the community doing speaking engagements from Rotary to civic groups to participating in fairs. Um, and then if you go to the next page of the summary, and then we can talk about these results before we move on. Um, this just gives you some of the data of the different people that we talked about. So it's called 98% um, of the survey respondents were residential customers. 96% live in single family homes. My apologies. Um, and 93% own their own homes. 52% of all customers feel that they're paying just the right amount for their water bill, which I think is pretty Are good. Are you supposed to advance the slide here? Or, or yeah, I was going to say, I think we might be a slide behind. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have the ability to do there that. There we go. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Um, Sixty percent of the customers um, would. Sorry, my neighbor's dogs are barking, and now all my dogs are barking. My goodness. Uh, I um, I rescue senior dogs, so I have a house full of eight dogs right now. So everyone's a little. Um, it's dinner time for them. They're waiting for their mom to feed. Actually, it's howling time. <laughs> my yeah. my apologies. Well, they're howling too. So, um, so anyway, sixty percent of the customers would prefer to receive communication via email, and twenty seven percent of the customers want to receive communication by email and traditional mail. So, and overall, the customers were very satisfied out of a thousand with your service. And they just felt they were not receiving communication on a regular basis through all different types of channels. So while they might be receiving communication regularly, they're looking for things not only via email, but by social media, as well as traditional mail. So putting some things together in a larger package, which will be after we answer questions on these two slides, what we're gonna talk about the exciting part of now that we have some data, is where do we go and what do we look for and what are we going to put together as a marketing communication strategy to achieve all of these goals? And we've already started some of it, which I'll share with you in the next in the next slide. But I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to um, ask any questions at this point, or if you'd like me to go through my thoughts on where we where we will go next, and then we can come back. We can do it in any direction you'd like. Any thoughts? I raised raise my hand here, uh, Steve. Oh, I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a question um, on the on the was it, was it uh, conducted in a way that prohibited uh, duplicates or people commenting more than once? Uh, yes, it was done through a legal certified survey program, and they were only allowed to use the IP address one time. It's supposed to feed out anyone that uses 
the same email address or the same IP address. Right, but and then people who did not want to take the survey online had the opportunity to call me personally, and we did the survey together. Great, thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I have one question for you, Marcy. Absolutely, Rick. Is um, so we have about eight thousand customers, and we got one thousand responses. Right. Is that a reasonable ratio that you expect? Another. Really really good. I That's was a really good ratio? Yeah, I was expecting okay. we were going to get five or 600 people back, not a thousand. We doubled my expectation on what, we, what we've what received. I guess that shows that we have a highly interested uh, group of people here in the Valley. You do, and you, you had a lot of people that called to, because my number was in the survey, to say thank you for sending out the survey, and they wanted me to know that they answered it, and you had a really nice, engaging group of people. People were really enthusiastic within the first three days of the survey going out we already had over 400 people respond so i think that's that's great okay. thank you you're welcome in your in your surveys do you use a, oh I, you didn't in this case but do you have uh, net promoter scores uh questions or question types for calculating a net promoter score um, I don't think Survey Legend does that, but I would have to look, but not in this survey that I'm aware of. Okay. Any other Bob, questions? Bob, Bob and Lou have questions. Well, Let's go with, uh, well Lou, Lou, Lou went. Lou should go first. Go ahead, Lou. Thanks, Bob. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Marcy, for your effort in helping us with this very important customer outreach project. You're welcome. I have three comments or, sure. or questions. Uh, sure. First of all, looking at the age demographic chart, uh, if I add together the 30, 39, and 40, 49, I get 17%. As I add the 60 to 69 and 70 plus, I get 58%. It strikes me that our, our elderly uh, ratepayers are overrepresented and our uh, adult working class uh, ratepayers are underrepresented. Does that bother you? Not at this current moment, but when we start using social media and start doing outreach and go back and do a follow-up in the next six months, and we don't have a younger audience and an engagement growth on our demographics for our social media, yes, it will bother me. But I'm hoping by using the tools that we're going to be implementing with Instagram and Facebook and becoming more aggressive on Nextdoor, that we'll see a new demographic report that really hits in that 30 to 50 year old range. Good. So we'll keep that in mind to try and encourage more yeah. from the younger and maybe not less from the older, but certainly get the younger more represented. Second Absolutely. question um, on the cost perception. Uh, it sounds like you've concluded that uh, the rate payers basically think that our rates are, are, are reasonable. And yes, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I agree with that because if you look at the about right, it's 51%. Uh, the too high is is uh, thirty one percent, and if you were to force these people to actually vote on a rate increase, I I, I rather I, I think that the don't knows will fall into the too high category as opposed to the not right, which makes it about fifty fifty, and I think it's it's we have to be careful that we don't misrepresent that data as far as what our customers think about our rate. Noted. And the last point is probably the most important. I, okay. I mean, I'm glad that we have a lot of people that are willing to uh, take the time to congratulate us on the job we're doing, both as a district and as a, as a board of, of directors. But I always find the most important and the pearls of wisdom usually come from the criticism. So as I was looking at the detail, I actually printed out seven pages of criticism comments that I think were very valid comments that needed to be analyzed. Uh, is there any going to be? Is there any going to be any effort towards that end? Oh, absolutely. Are you talking about the Excel data chart? Well, the individual comments. Yes. So all of those comments go into the next phase, which will be you talking about next, and the marketing plan and how we address the positive and the negative comments and how they fall into some key categories. So those comments will be taken into consideration when we plan our public relations and media outreach, when we do our social media strategy, when we do our e-newsletters, and when we build out our content calendar. 
And those will continue to be looped in to every outreach that we do while we're working on our primary messaging. And who actually is going to be doing that analysis in your mind? I will be working, Carly is my point person, and then Rick is my secondary point person, and I will be working directly with them. It will be myself from my team as the owner, and I will be working directly with the two of them, and we actually have our first meeting tomorrow morning. Okay. Well, I would just make a passion plea that we we make sure we get enough people from the district in, involved because um, this goes right to priorities for the future for the water district. And I want to make sure that that we have all the right people at the right levels integrated into into the the criticism comments in terms of trying to validate what's good, what's not, and then trying to prioritize what we're going to work on first, second, and third, because this really goes to transparency for the district. Absolutely. I, I don't know how that works with your group, but my first meeting is with Carly and um, Rick tomorrow, and we can go from there and determine how we're going to do it. I, I have some thoughts on how I would normally do it, but once I learn who needs to be involved in the outreach campaign, then we can put that committee together. Are you going to come back with some um, with the mechanics of this as well as some conclusions? later or how is it what's the next step yeah so the next step is to take all of the comments positive and negative and take the results and develop an actual marketing plan on how we can achieve addressing all of that and achieve the goals of making sure our messaging is focusing on construction and capital improvement programs and how we take the district to the next level with our communication are you going to try to um make an effort at looking at the what is the most important order with, with force ranking these these things going forward? That would be my goal that I would be doing with Carly and Rick on reviewing all of them and prioritizing and then putting the plan together in a priority order with Thanks. a timeline as well. Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. Thank you, Lou. Thanks. Bob, did you have a yeah just a just comment? a couple of couple of questions, maybe a yeah, comment. Absolutely, Bob. On on the um Following up on Rick's comment, uh, the thousand people mm -hmm. um, are we are those unique subscribers? That is one thousand out of our eight thousand, or could it possibly be two or three people in a really? household uh, answered? Um, the way the way Survey Legend is supposed to legally dedupe the data, it should only be one person per household. How, how would they be able to do that? According to the rules and regulations, it's by email address and IP address on a computer. But if, you know, like my, my wife and I have different, you know, email addresses, different computers, different IP addresses, you know, um, I don't know that there's any way to necessarily um, make it so that that is 1,000 of our 8,000 subscribers. I'm, I'm skeptical about that. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, I, I so. Yeah, and, and also, Lou, I think, Lou, your, your insight about the demographics is spot on. That, that leapt off the page to me. And I think that also relates potentially to the responses on the rates. So if you look at our actual rate distribution, rather than looking at average, because we have a very, very long tail of uh, water usage, a better one to look at is median. And on median, we're about three units to three and a half units a month. Um, so the, the bill there would be really substantially different from the $80. So if they're looking at the 80 as average and they're saying, well, hey, I'm paying 60, whatever it is, um, I'm, I'm doing great. Um, so I, I, I share Lou's skepticism on the, on the rate side. I, I, um, I, I don't think that's the case. And then with respect to the social media outreach, um, you know, we had, Different age groups, different demographics. Um, I'm glad to hear you're thinking about using Instagram, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. They they all have very different demographics, and the younger people, I think, are going to be less interested in the hard copy uh, push. I, I'm not interested in the hard copy from a cost point of view, but I, I think as we see the demographics changing in our community. Uh, we need to be uh, cognizant of that and build our marketing plan to address that on a going forward basis. 
We actually already set up Instagram, so it's ready to go. And we're building out the content calendar, which we'll review with our internal contacts starting tomorrow. And Twitter? We haven't built out Twitter yet. We need to talk about that tomorrow. Okay. But it addresses a very different person, as you as you well know. <laughs> so. All right, thank you. Hey, Bob. Marcy, we don't want to uh, hold you up, so we'd like you to be able to keep your momentum going. So okay. please continue through your presentation. No worries. Um, I just, well, I mean, I pretty much addressed it talking to Bob and Lou, but I'll just um, go back over it quickly. That the most important part is to make sure we get our messaging and our content calendar down, look at all of the different comments and prioritize this into a strategic marketing plan that includes public relations and media outreach, like we talked about, an aggressive social media campaign, and building out e-newsletters, and what we're going to do for our educational classes now that we're in the era of COVID and we have Zoom as our worldly situation, what opportunities we have and what are we going to do, I, and how we're going to continue to spread our message. So, um, that will all be in the next steps of a marketing plan. If you, um, in your packet, there was something called a marketing overview. It was just a sheet of um, campaign possible elements. These are items that we put together for your review that just really, you can look at it and then reach out to me either directly or we can set up um, another Zoom call. But these are the type of things that we are looking that will go into the marketing plan that will help address some of the positive and negative issues. It doesn't include the content calendar with them, but it gives you a bigger picture overview of the types of items that we feel are a result of what came out of the marketing survey and a grid on some possible topics and content that we would be working on. But again, this isn't finalized. This is a very rough, big picture overview of some things that are our starting point for our marketing plan. Does anyone have any questions or would like me to go into in depth on anything more or do some research on something and bring something back to the group, which I'm absolutely happy to do? What's the timeline, uh, Marcy, that you have for the marketing plan? You're meeting with the staff tomorrow. Yeah, in the next 60 days, we plan to have a detailed marketing plan and timeline put together, if not sooner. Okay. Uh, Bob, you have a question? Well, I just want to say, um, Marcy, that I, you know, we've, we've had marketing communications assistance in the past. And I just want to say the amount of really concrete information, though I still think some of it might be a little loose, but the amount of information that you've been able to gather in the time period and for the money that's been spent, uh, and I'm assuming we haven't spent it all at this point. No, <laughs> um, not that, even close. Yeah, that compared to what we were paying uh, one of your competitors a few years ago, this, this is really, I think, um, a, a really major step forward. I am personally would like to see in, in your next drop of information, what some of those specific goals are in terms of people following us, for example, on Instagram or Facebook, you know, retweets, if we go down the Twitter path, right. that sort of thing in terms of how do we measure what the impact actually has so that we can figure out what our return on investment is and make, you know, make sure that we're really spending the money here uh, really well. I, I don't, ever want to get into the situation we were in before where that money just seemed to go vanish in the, into the ether and we didn't really get anything for it. Well, um, I hope you, I hope at the end of the day, you'll, you'll feel like you're getting a value out of us. And, and just so you're aware, as, as we've gone along, we've also not just done stuff in, stuff in a timeline that we're just doing this survey right now and getting the results. We've helped Carly and Rick with several press releases out there we negotiated a free ad in the paper. We've been working on a couple of different things with different opportunities. Um, so we've been working really hard to keep things going and to keep the organization out there while we're at the same time trying to finish putting together phase one of the results. Yeah, it shows. It shows. Thank you. Great. Uh, <clears throat> any other questions from or comments from the staff or directors? We have. Uh, question from the uh, from the attendees, uh, Tina Marie. You are recognized. If you have a question, 
Uh, thank you. Um, I have a comment about the last one, but I'll wait on that. Um, as far as uh, a earlier question asked about how can you ensure that people are from the, are you, were you, you were looking to just uh, do this per household. Is that my understanding? We use the um, San Lorenzo Valley Water District. That is correct. Yeah. So uh, to address the IP issue, the, the, the answer is like that each person would have a different email address. And I think that's how they, um, how it seems like that's how you were keeping track of how this was happening. And it was all done through emails through a third party platform that's a secure platform called Survey and Legend. Yeah. So then they, they, each household, like if you have a single router in your home, which is generally the case, then, um, then each household would have the same IP address, but each computer would end it in like, uh, like it would be dot one, dot two, dot three, dot ten, whatever the case may be for how many computers are in the home. So you could the first part of the IP address would address like that is that particular household, and then then the each comp individual computer would be given an, an extension for that um, IP address. If, I hope that answers the earlier director's question. Thank you. I about was going to check the survey legend tomorrow just to triple <laughs> confirm how I understood it correctly. So, but thank you for that. Thank you. I um, the, generally understand that for sure. Yeah. But then the, the, the downside of that is like um, that I also use a VPN. So like I could watch certain shows like in Britain and stuff that aren't necessarily available to me otherwise. So if someone is using a VPN, then there's no way for you to know if they're in the same household. Um, so that's the caveat to that. So I just wanted to address that, that earlier question. Thank you, Tina Marie. Thank you. Any other uh, questions for... Tina, or comments from anyone? Well, like I said, I had a comment about the earlier thing, but I'll. Okay, thank you. Um, Anything else for me while hey. you have me on the line? I think we're, uh, I, I don't see any hands coming up, uh, Marcy. So thank you very much for your presentation. We look forward to the uh, the exciting marketing plan uh, coming down the road. Thank you very much for all your work so far. And we look forward to continuing to uh, reap the benefits of more of your work. Well, thank you. And if anyone has any questions, you're absolutely welcome to reach out and email me and I'll do my best to answer anything. Thank you. Time to go feed your dogs now before they start <laughs> eating you. Chaos. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay, bye. bye. Uh, so moving on, let's see. Tina, you had a question. You wanted to go back to one item because we're at the end of this uh, meeting. We got the consent agenda. And nothing uh, yeah, else so go ahead. Uh, my question and, was re regarding the earlier issue. Like you asked if the public had comments and I had my hands full of food and I wasn't able to raise my hand fast enough. But anyway, um, I, I wanted to say that... Video? Yeah, so I know this is going to be redirected to the admin committee, which I think is a good a good plan for that. Uh -huh. And then um, uh, that that I don't think that members of the public should be running in last minute and and getting things on the agenda. I think that that I agree with Lois and that you know the board members should have time to review things before they go on the agenda. Um, and I think that that that's a better plan. And I as far as um, getting things on the agenda. That like staff bring up, I um, I, I so, sort of feel the same way. Like I feel like that the board members should have time to review things, um, unless it's an emergency situation, which clearly is common lately. Um, so I feel like um, that yeah, things should be on the agenda. And then I also think I agree with getting the agenda to be, you know, if you wanted to move it entirely online as much as possible, where that whereas that is um, both accessible, you know. ADA accessible and so forth. I think that would save some money for the board. And then, um, and I think that that's um, the most efficient way to do it. So that like I did get Holly's update to the agenda via my email and I appreciated that. So in the future, that that was just my comment is that I agree with Lois and that I don't, I don't think that the board should have to deal with last minute items and unless it's an emergency. And then also if you, could save money by moving things online. I think that's a valuable, valuable thing. Great, thank you. And I'm sure Lois loves hearing people like to agree with her, so. <laughs> thank you. 
for that. The uh, Rick, anything else you want to bring up? Otherwise, we're going to move to item six, right? No, I think we're we're good to move ahead. All right. So we have the consent agenda and the minutes. Does anybody have anything they want to pull from the uh, minutes or pull the minutes? I don't see any hands. All right. I lost my hands option here. Okay. There we go. All right. No hands coming up from anybody. So with that, there's no written communication, no informational material. So item number nine, adjournment. Yay. We are adjourned. All right, Steve, thank you. We'll see you all in two weeks.